Hello once again, my friends. It's me, the voices in your headphones. Today, we're not being joined by Jack, not this time, no. Instead, we're dragging in another prominent Discord member, uh, Squeaks, known for working on his current alternative reality game project, Broadside Beach. And this episode, we're going to be talking pretty much exclusively about that, because it's always good to give somebody a platform. So, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, hi, uh, I go by Squeaks to Rory Online. I make ARG videos. I'm also a game developer, but that's mostly a side thing because my YouTube channel. Um, as of right now, I'm working on the alternate reality game, Broadside Beach, which is basically about... A, it's like a Disney World kind of attraction, but it's run by a different company with different motives, of course, and there's something wrong at the center of the whole company. Because every corporation story has to have them doing something fucked up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The very first thing, because I know it's the biggest thing that everybody's going to compare it to immediately is, oh, it's like Five Nights at Freddy's, but it's not. And why is it not? Okay, so right off the bat, it's because we're not using, you know, standard animatronics this time. We opted for mascot costumes. And the reason for that is because the difference between using that and an animatronic is that with a mascot costume, it's human operated. There's a lot more potential for, like, slasher style kills as opposed to just the typical scary and a lot of horror stuff that you see in FNAF style videos. And going with that, uh, I think it's best to start out with the very beginning, which is, what inspired the project? Okay, so back before Broadside Beach actually became a thing, I was really interested in like Disney horror, like Abandoned by Disney, Corruptus, all that stuff. And I wanted to kind of fit my own kind of narrative into that. I was really into Treasure Island back when that was a thing as well, and actually helped to develop the 2020 version of the game. But around the time I started working on Broadside Beach, it was because I wanted to work on something with it. But originally, I didn't want to use Disney's own characters because that could land me in legal trouble. So I just went with building my own cast and set from the ground up. And that's where Broadside Beach came from. And so the most prominent character, as anybody that's seen you know, your icon, a profiling thing, being Bucky, uh, would he be particularly based on anything, or was that just fully your okay. first? Okay, so... Go ahead. He's actually based off of a character that I made like, what, like two, three years ago called Waffle. Never really used him for anything, he's also a beaver, but like, I wanted to kind of use him originally in a horror setting. That never really went through, so instead I made a new character for it, which is Bucky, of course. And I just based him off the sailor design of Donald, and because, you know, it was an island, so we needed some kind of like, sailor character, and he was the main one. You know, I, I typically, I expected to have like a list at my ready, but like I said, I just got home, I didn't get time to put the list together. Yeah, I can understand that. So anyways, and it's mostly animated in the uh, Unreal Engine, right? Or is yes, that Unreal Engine. Right. Because I've seen, because you said you're a game dev, and I've seen most things animated in uh, Blender. I honestly don't think I've seen much animated with the Unreal Engine, so how does that usually go? Okay, so uh, normally what you have to do is you have to get the animation data itself, which you often export from a program like Blender. So I animate it in Blender, or I use motion capture software to do like actual motions for the characters, export all of that into Unreal Engine, and then I use the Sin Machine, which is basically like an aspect of the engine that allows you to do cinematics and everything. I use that and I create scenes, render them out from the engine, and export them back into the video editor. So it's kind of a back and forth little thing. Yeah, bit more painful, but it looks a lot better in my opinion. So. Yeah, because I've seen, I've seen a fair few bits of broadside. Obviously, fucking I'm part of it in a small <laughs> capacity at this point. Yeah. So, uh, I don't really do anything big for the viewers. I just do a cameo voice every now and again. But, like you said, you do typically motion captures. How do you? What's your little setup there? I'm curious. Well, we don't actually have anything like a motion capture like suit or anything. So uh, I'm already working with VR technology and everything. Like I'm a VR game developer. So I have a program that actually will use the head as the head tracker, the hands as the hand trackers, and they just use inverse kinematics to like fake the rest of the body. I mean, that makes sense. It, uh, gives you something to kind of follow along with because... Let's see, because I'm trying to think... Because I've seen it in motion, and you've got, especially when you got characters interacting with others, uh, most notably, the, I think the most infamous scene is, you know, bashing his head against, I think it was like the stove or microwave. Yeah. 
So did you personally act that out, or did you just end up... Uh, uh no, I, I acted that out, actually. I... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's kind of stiff motion, obviously. I think that's what you're kind of going for with the, you know, being the whole suit thing. But... I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. We should probably actually kind of lay the foundation before we start <laughs> rambling too much before anybody knows what the fuck we're talking about. So, would you like to talk about the vague story of Broadside without it being too spoiler? Okay, so the idea is that it's a company which is, you know, relatively well known at the time, at least before it, the world just kind of forgot about it once it kind of fizzled out of public knowledge. But they were around way back in like the 40s making cartoons and everything. And eventually they decided to open up theme parks, kind of like how Disney did. And originally they built one over on an island because they thought it would be, you know, we're a little more isolated, it's a more unique experience. Uh, then Disney started to do the same thing, so they began to panic. They lost a bunch of sales and just shut down the island as a whole, and opted instead to move into Disney's territory, and they made a Florida-bound theme park, which was called Studio Grounds. And this is like where a good chunk in the series will take place. The uh, second episode is all about it. But uh, from there, the rest of the series basically is about other places in Studio Grounds, the park itself, some of the cartoons that actually air on the TV and everything, and of course Shipwrecked, which is the game that they're working on as well. So, uh, would it be too would it be too spoilery to talk about like you know what makes it a horror series or would you? Okay, so uh, I think I touched on this vaguely in the actual episode. So uh, the costumes are implied to not actually have people inside of them. Well, people in quotations. I don't really know a good way of putting it without spoiling entire series but um there's not necessarily people in them to say the least they are i guess it's safe to call them monsters like i've already showed pictures of them in hidden dropbox links and everything but uh they are uh, to say the least not exactly on the human side of things so yeah, they're, they're a little bit fucked is what i've seen <laughs> yeah uh let's see because I know the point of analog horror is kind of piecing things together and figuring out what's what. Yeah. And I haven't dove too deep into it personally myself. Would it be spoiler to say what the motivations of the creatures are, or are they just kind of acting out as, like, instinct? Well, most of them, I'm just going to come and say this, most of them aren't actually hostile, which it might seem a bit like juxtaposition to their appearance, but the only one that's actually been shown to be hostile, at least so far, that I've revealed is Bucky. So... None of the other ones are really as aggressive as him, to the least. Gotcha. So that's where it's kind of veering off from the typical, like I said, Five Nights-inspired horror where every yeah. fucking thing's trying to murder somebody. Yeah. So now it's just one that people don't really know about. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's see. Because uh, well, you mentioned the company. What would the company's name be just for future? Uh, it just, about? It's Broadside Animation Studios. Gotcha. So, let's see. Because I'm trying to find a way to let you talk about the series without revealing too much. Because we've covered where it came from. Let's see. Uh, how many people are typically involved in the project? Because I know you do most of the heavy lifting, but you got voice actors. You got. Uh, I know you're kind of got your own little community going. Yeah, so we got like maybe like 10, 15 voice actors or so. But some of them I reuse for different roles. Uh, like, one of them is, like, like Fox or something like that. They have voiced, like, three different characters in the series. But they always knock it out of the park, so I don't mind it, though. Really. It's really uh, well done. Yeah, they're the one that does the voice of the instructor for the little training thing, right? Yeah, he was so good. Yeah. Yeah, because I've, like I said, I've uh, only seen a few of the, like, big ones. But, yeah, that, <laughs> uh, what was his name again? Uh, Fox. Yeah, Fox. Yeah, like you said, it kind of knocks it out of the park. He kind of really <laughs> knows how to sell it, which is... It's like uh, it's like every other analog horror, except he actually has like a personality behind the instructor voice, which I like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see. Uh, so what are you trying to do personally with the series? Because, like, like you said, it's... First off, obviously, you're trying to tell a story, but you're recently you've been creeping into digital media because you've got the... Uh, Tapes, tapes going, going as yeah. one of the projects. Yeah, and so you've also, also got the gaming development. So, my my goal kind of is to like take the idea of analog core and like 
build on it in a way like i want to like i know there's like existing tropes and everything set up but my idea is that i want to build on those tropes that already exist i know that episodes one and two are both like really derivative so far of like analog horror but i want to kind of take what analog horror has provided as like tropes and i want to build on them and approve them in certain ways yeah because like you said it because what I what it looks like what you're doing is like I said again with the tapes with the game you're very much trying to make it as realistic as possible like with multimedia uh, projects. So uh, also just to make for the record I should probably say for the uh, audience would it be uh, would it be too much to discuss your age because I feel like that's kind of a sm small factor in what kind of makes me impressed with Broxide itself. Okay yeah I'm 16 and I started working on the game when I was around like 14 years old. Not, not the game, yeah. sorry, like the ultimate reality game. Yeah, so Squeaks is a bit on the younger side, which is, like I said, which kind of impresses me because you've got people that, uh, fucking professionals that only bust out, you know, just a video or two fucking once a month. You, within two years, have made multiple videos, games, uh, different kinds of projects. You've just kind of, kind of got the whole thing on lockdown. <laughs> yeah. Which, uh, Admittedly, the the series itself is kind of amateurish, which that's nothing terrible. It's like I said, that's why I kind of wanted to bring up the age thing because you're still young, you're still work developing your skills, and from what I've seen, it's well, it's not the best. It's not anything I want people to to deride too much because it's like one of your first major projects, if I recall. Yeah, and I think the last like big episode that I've released was like what like six months ago or so. I I've learned a lot since then actually about how this sort of thing. Yeah, that's kind of what I mentioned it in some of my earlier videos. My favorite thing with horror, especially one of the reasons I like to critique it, is to see you know people get yeah. better. Yeah, which is a lot. For example, for example fucking buddy. like the whole Cave of Shadows thing became was then made in by the same people that made The Sun Vanished, which was a fucking yeah. massive yeah. shift in quality. So oh, uh, totally. I mean, they could yeah, step up from seeing Mr. Giraffe bleeding all over a piece of paper <laughs> for like a solid like minute or so. Yeah. God, I actually fucking rewatched that video just to like compare my quality to what I'm trying to do now, and I forgot how long that fucking bleeding segment goes on. Speed it up. But yeah, uh, we're not here to discuss that. We're here to discuss your projects. Uh, because, well, I do want to keep discussing broadside. You've got other things in the work. You've got uh, Polar Dread, which is a VR game that I. Would love to demo. Unfortunately, I'm uh, tech lit and I don't have any VR equipment. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Okay, so Polar Dread started like two years ago as like a small an F fan game project, kind of. Uh, that like a way back before even had VR properly, but I think once I started to put it into VR, I kind of fizzled all those elements out and tried to work with my own gameplay and stuff instead. Um, it's different. From broadside where broadside focuses on being like slow this is it's very fast paced to say the least uh like it requires you to like duck under the table throw objects at certain enemies grab things off your face that jump onto it throw them against the table it's like there's a lot of movement to say the least so yeah as you said it was kind of like a five nights fan game but so what you're kind of going with it is you want it to be more like in depth you don't want it just to be like look at thing hit button you want to yeah. very much interact yeah. with the environment yeah that was my goal with the game from like the very beginning yeah because i've seen clips from it but i like said i haven't played it for myself uh, uh what's the uh, basis of the story there okay so the idea is that you are like playing as a person named sam sam is like very like explicitly undetailed when it comes to their like appearance their personality Basically everything about them. I don't even give them a face, I just make them wear a mask. And the reason for this is because I want the player to be able to project themselves onto Sam and like, you know, kind of live in their shoes while they're playing the game, if that makes sense. Yeah, like, the most, get the yeah. most uh, immersion you can. Yeah, so... Wait, wait. Oh, good. I don't want to go too much into detail about the game's story yet because I haven't actually fully implemented it. But the idea is that every night you would talk to someone over the phone as well, named Isaac, which I know it sounds similar to Matt, but the part that sets it apart is that Isaac, he, he hates you as like the player, and he will constantly berate you, blame you for things happening around the resort, and he is quite literally one of the final bosses of the game, so I, it sounds weird on paper, but like it'll make more sense when the actual game so, releases. So he's your anti-phone guy. 
basically. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, let's see, because you've been making this game for VR. Because uh, I don't know anything about VR development, I'm not going to lie to you. I barely know anything about proper game development. Uh, so, I assume this is also being made in Unity, or is this a different system? Uh, I'm still using Unreal for it. Un yeah, I mean, yeah, Unreal, not Unity. What the fuck? I don't think Unity even does VR things. Oh, it does actually. It's like Oculus's favorite engine right now. They have completely neglected Unreal in favor of Unity. Oh man, I am completely out of the loop when it comes to this stuff, as you can tell. Yeah. But that's why I wanted to talk to you and to get more insight on how other projects work. Yeah. And you've been also, since we're talking about the game development side of things, uh, bouncing it back to Broadside, you've got Shipwrecked going on, which is, as I've as you've shown, you managed someone actually managed to port it to an actual N64 cartridge because that's the basis that it's going for, it's like yeah, design wise. Yeah, that's uh, that's the team's animator. He goes by Firecat Productions. Very talented individual. I don't know how he does half the things he does, but uh, whenever we're not using motion capture, he's often the one that's animating things. Oh, I figured you were part, uh, doing a good portion of the animating, but. Like I said, I didn't actually actually know how big your team is personally. So yeah. Uh, so specifically, besides the motion capture, what exactly is your role? Like, obviously, editor, writer, yeah, uh, so director. I design the characters. I voice some of them, which I haven't really gotten into detail about yet. Um, I, of course, I do motion capturing. I am in charge of the lighting, scene building. I design the actually. Did I say I design the characters? If you got yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so I often have to, like, I storyboard some scenes out for myself as well. I, of course, edit each video. Um, I am in charge of audio design, like sound design and everything. Um, uh, script writing, of course, that's like, another big aspect of it. Cause, like, I have to make sure that all the dialogue doesn't sound stilted, which it normally does anyways. <laughs> so, and then, of course, I also have to do the ARG elements of, like, all the separate Twitter accounts, all the uh, all the websites and everything. I have to keep manage all that as well. Yeah, because basically a PR role, which is even more insane when it's not an actual company. <laughs> yeah. But let's see, because you uh, you've got like so you got shipwrecked going in. Is I'm kind of, I'm kind of thinking if it's if it'd be possible to since you can get it ported to an N64 card, if it'd be possible to sell it for people that might be interested. Well, I'm not Although, sure about actually porting it. I think what he did was uh, he made like a fake cartridge and everything for it, and he actually had it hooked up to his computer while he ran the footage and everything. I think that's what he did. I'd have to ask him about it. Like, I'm kind of out of the loop on that sort of thing. But, gotcha, because the footage made it seem like he like yeah, it was got, very, into, like, got the ROM into it. Very convincing, but... With it being built in Unreal Engine, it's kind of hard to like actually get it onto a cartridge like that. Uh, our in-universe explanation for it was just that Unreal, since it's like the engine itself has been around since like the late '90s when the actual shipwreck came was made and everything. Uh, our idea was that um, Unreal, like the first version of the engine, was used to build it, and it just ported the files over to the current version. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, how significant of the story, how significant to the story would the game be, in your opinion? Okay, so it goes more into detail about a lot of the things that have already been discussed in the episodes that haven't really gotten enough screen time yet. Um, it also goes into detail about new aspects of the story and things that I haven't really discussed, which are pretty significant, the things that are in the universe and everything. And then, in addition to that, there is also um edition of the game's developer itself and what happened to him he also plays a bit of a role in the story so he's relatively important as well so it, it's it's pretty important if you're following the ig you follow through the game and everything gotcha because i honestly kind of love mixed media things like this yeah okay. that's uh, what like think. that's what breaks okay. immersion for like other series like the molten files for instance it's just when you're when, when you're only watching it, you're not really like engaging with it at all. It just kind of loses immersion for me. Yeah, cause I'm trying to think of other ARGs that have done the whole multimedia thing. Cause I, I know I know that Jimini and Gemini, sorry, Home Entertainment did it. 
as like one of their episodes had a game that was built into it, but it like wasn't very fleshed out, I don't think. Yeah, and I know um, Everman Hybrid did a piece with it because Everman Hybrid has done literally everything. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think the most they got into it was using uh, Minecraft server. They didn't like go oh, yeah. as far as to make their own game. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, Would have been cool though. I'm trying to remember a really interesting ARG that it was like made in the Source Engine where. Oh, was it like found on the tape? That's the name. Yeah. Yeah, because I like I said, I love things like that where it's like you have to. Did that actually go anywhere? And now that I think about it. It is. Yeah, it ended out of nowhere, but like they didn't give any like proper conclusion to it. Oh, that sucks. So it didn't have a real ending. Yeah. Oh well, but yeah. Uh, let's see. Anything you want to say about the series, like Broadside itself, or do you want to move on to what is going to ask about next? Uh, maybe whatever you want to ask about next. Because I was going to also ask about you have another project in the works. Uh, I don't recall the title. All I call it to myself was the bed game. Oh yeah, that one. Uh, yeah, that one's like a whole other story. So we called it Counting Sheep for the time being. So that's like the main mechanic of the game uh so that one was that was a doozy to program let me tell you well tell me <laughs> well uh, <laughs> okay so it was like i spent like a good like three years wanting to make it i think and only like late 2021 I actually got around to properly producing it so uh originally what i had to do was i just had the player like slightly under the floor and they would just be standing up the entire time, but it would make them look like it was in a bed. Lema City I could have possibly went with, by the way. I don't know what I was thinking when we put it together back in 2019, but it was... It, it was bad. Like, <laughs> But, uh, like, three years later, I think, I picked it up and tried it again. And actually built a mapping out system where you can, like, use two corners of your bed and, like, actually create a bed of mesh that you can lay down on. That matches up to your physical, real-life bed. And it was... It was so satisfying when I first got it working, but uh, it's been a little slow as of late because we're still kind of waiting on like character designs, and models, and all that. Uh, but I'm hoping it's gonna be like my first commercial game that I can actually like, sell once it's out. So, what's, so the, what's the, the gist of the gameplay game gonna be like? Okay, so it's kind of hard to describe given how it's like kind of a new concept to the whole VR space. Yeah. But the idea yeah. is that you are playing the game laying down the whole time. You can sit up in your bed, of course, but the idea is that if you step off your bed, you get dragged underneath. So you have to be careful and like, stay within the region of your bed. Um, there's like these monsters that will come out of the closet and like come through the doors and everything. And you have a flashlight to keep yourself protected from some of them. Other ones, however, are kind of the opposite. They will crawl onto your bed and like stare at you. You have to stay perfectly still laying down. Any sort of movement will trigger an attack to them. So it's like a mixture of different mechanics. The flashlight also works as like... You can also use it to like interact with objects in the room. So if there's like something you want to knock over to distract an enemy, you can point the flashlight at it, squeeze the trigger, and it'll knock it over. So that's kind of like the basic game that we've set up for it. So it's basically uh, Sleep Paralysis the game. <laughs> yeah! Because... <laughs> honestly, I'd kind of... I think I could vibe with that. Kind of a lazy type VR game. Just... Yeah, it's something new, at least. Like, I've never really seen a bit done before. Yeah, it's always good to try and reach... Uh, there's a fucking... A, what what Death Stranding called it? A, a strand-type game, so... You're trying to inter pioneer the first bed-type game. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Because I think that covers most of your major projects, and we've only been going for about... 25 minutes. I try to make these at least now half an hour, 45 minutes the shortest. So, anything you would like to bring up and discuss? I'm not too sure, actually. Uh, in terms of, like, what I want to do next for my projects, of course I want to get Shipwrecked out there. Um, one thing I'm excited about regarding that, though, is probably how the actual gameplay works. Because I know there's, like, a big surge of, like, these analog horror games coming out right now where it's just like oh do these tasks get scared this this and that uh shipwrecked is kind of different in that sense where what we've done is we put in a lot of effort into like actually making this work but 
the game is multi-layered and it only will scare you if you decide to break the game enough. So you can go through the entire game without getting scared once, play through the entire emulator, let the game close, and then from there you can go with off without a hitch. But if you were to break the game, find secret items, so on and so forth, uh, you can access the other layers of the game. There's like two other layers that are hidden under the main layer. And these are where most of the scares would come from. So, um, for instance, one layer contains like information about some of the stuff that happened at the park, which I don't want to go into yet. And then other layers pertain to other people that haven't really been mentioned in the story yet. Well, now part of me is kind of wishing I didn't ask that because uh, I try to help Squeaks with uh, whenever I can, which has honestly not been that much, but you know. And I've offered to basically bug test the game when it starts becoming a more yeah, lucky you playable product. Yeah. So I didn't realize that me explicitly trying to break the game is going to be what's going to be triggering this stuff. Yeah. So that's going to be fun for me. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what we're going for right now. I want it to be like, you can scare yourself if you want to, but it's not really like required to beat the game. Yeah, kind of like the... Uh, I did like a video on it looking at the Mario yeah. game that's kind of like that. Yeah, it's like that but, in a way. Yeah, so. Speaking of uh, fucking that game, I honestly I need to make more videos on it because I only made like the two, like, and one of this on my side channel. <laughs> but, you know, bu busy forever. Uh, have you just seen like the map of that game? I haven't actually seen the map. It's like a multi-layered fucking dimensional abominably just looking at this map. <laughs> oh god. Because like every time you go into a room, there's a decent chance it's a different room. Oh, uh, it's like one of those things where it's like all randomly generated. Uh, to an extent, yeah. Oh like, god. <laughs> I distinctly remember there's like a plaza, you know, in Mario 64, the main plaza. Yeah. But you're in the beta version of that, and then I was just kind of running around trying to find things, and I find another version of the plaza. And then another version of the plaza, and then I find the <laughs> plaza from the final game, which just threw me off. Oh, that's surreal. I like that, actually. Yeah, it's like, just like slightly subtle things. Yeah, it's like it's the a... slight changes that throw you off. Yeah, it's a very interesting game. <laughs> yeah. But let's see, what else to discuss? Because since we're kind of on the topic of projects, I guess I can bring up some of the things I'm working on currently. Yeah, totally. Uh, one thing I'm doing is, so I've got these like iceberg videos that I've been trying to work on, and admittedly, I've I'm not even really using the iceberg format. I'm basically just using it as an excuse just to ramble about things I like. <laughs> yeah. But I've one of the things on it. I'm discussing old horror blogs from like especially the Slenderman Mythos, and yeah. because I'm really fond of those, I'm currently doing a reading on one of my favorites called uh, A Really Bad Joke. Which, basically, I'm trying to get, like, an audio log. Not audio log. Uh, well, I get, a reading is the best way to say it. Because I'm... When I edit it, it's going to be... I'm trying to... Get, when I get this thing all edited, I'm going to try to edit it to where it's not just, you know, hearing me talk. I'm trying to get some kind of visual component going. But, yeah. Yeah, I'm currently in the midst of that. I think about a fifth of the way through recording and then yeah. I need to wait for Jack's parts and then I need to edit it all together. I think it's going to be like five hours of audio to edit, so oh, probably wow. kill me there. <laughs> and beyond that, I'm currently gathering videos for another series I want to break into where I'm effectively just talking about, like, you know, the classic ghost video is fucking people go in a room, something's being pulled, yeah, uh, like thrown around, things like that. I kind of wanted to do a series where I'm discussing those and kind of just reviewing them. First off, like breaking down, like, oh, how was this probably made? And even with those components, is it good at being spooky? Yeah, like I've seen a lot of those actually. So, like, yeah, I love I love watching cheesy videos like that. I've I've dedicated too much of my time to shit like Nuke's Top <laughs> Five and fucking Bizarre Bub. Chills videos, yeah. Surprisingly, not that many chills videos. Thank God. <laughs> I, I don't have anything against the guy. It's just... Uh, it's it's all within the same camp, but also his stuff is just like... I don't know. It doesn't have the draw to me that it used to. And then again, a lot of the videos don't. My cousin used to watch like a ton of that, but like I was never really that interested. 
I, which is kind of why I want to bring a new aspect to it of like, you know, review and discuss. Yeah, like bringing up how it's like possible and everything. Yeah, because there was one in particular where uh, it was a TikTok video. Some guy is kind of doing renovations in his bathroom and then he starts hearing a voice call. To, he's home alone and he starts hearing a voice call to him from another room. But the problem is the voice he's hearing is his voice. Okay, that's... <laughs> Do you even need so, to explain how that's faked, though? Like, <laughs> Not really, It, but that's kind of why, where I kind of want to discuss yeah. it is because I want to talk like, hey, obviously it's someone else holding the camera and he's off in the other room calling out. Like, it's very simply done, but it's also <laughs> fucking spooky as shit. And it's good. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of these videos, if you, some of them are better when you break them down like that. Or some of them are a lot worse when you do. Because <laughs> yeah. in that one's case, simplicity there is the key. It's not some big thing. Honestly, it kind of uh, ruins itself a little because while he's in the bathroom, suddenly something comes up in the door and just starts going. Oh. And, you know, it kind of kills us suddenly. Yeah. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. But that's honestly the only two things I'm working on right now. I... Uh, I work too much. <laughs> That's so a lot of my products come out really slow. It's half the reason I do these voice box things, just to be able to sit down, shoot the shit with some Discord members, and just talk about whatever they want to talk about. I mean, I do know a thing or two about going slowly. Like, I think I produce broadside episodes, like actual like mainline episodes, like every six months or so. It's yeah. it's a bit of a nightmare. Yeah, I try to at least get some kind of video out uh, once a month, like. Oh god, that SCP video. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sat through that, that whole thing. Oh, go ahead. I sat through that whole thing. That's. Oh. <laughs> I didn't expect that to take as long as I did. I thought that'd be a two week project of just. Because it's just a big shit post. No, nah, that's going to be new the entire month. <laughs> uh, and I, I, it's not even to the quality I wanted it to be. Because I, I brought it down to the wire. I finished it on like 10 p.m. March 31st. <laughs> I mean, like, to be fair, though, how, how quality do you want top 10 sexies of SP, SCPs to be, though? Like, Yeah, it was supposed to be kind of a shit post, but I have absurdly <laughs> high qualities, even for dumb humor. Yeah. But, also, I basically nobody watched the video, which I think it's either A, because it's a weird departure, B, people either just aren't really interested in that for my content, or C, note the content of the video YouTube just didn't show people. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna lie, there's so many images in that thing I had to censor like a motherfucker. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, the moment I saw that text being dragged into the screen, I knew I was in for a trip. And it yeah, still it somehow like, caught me by surprise. God, I, I, honestly, my favorite dumb joke... Like, I'm, I hate to talk about, oh, my favorite dumb jokes and my own shit, but uh, I'm a fucking big fan of the lobotomy corporation games so i had to include something from that towards like wait a second this isn't scp <laughs> but let's see. what else to discuss because we're at 35 minutes i this is a lot less material than i is expecting it to be <laughs> yeah i wish i came in with like more information and everything i just i'm not a very interesting individual yeah that's why we write uh, questions beforehand, and I neglected to do this. <laughs> <laughs> when I do this with Jack, typically I write down like a document, send that to them, and then we uh, kind of wing it from there. For the sake of it not getting super awkward for everybody, I think this should probably be a good time to call it. It's a bit shorter than I wanted it to be, but that is how it goes sometimes. Yeah. Sorry about that. Otherwise, I don't think people are going to want to listen to me ramble about how I'm like trying to read knew my script not my script my set to be more like visually visually pleasing I try to rely on it less uh redesign voices for the third time now because <laughs> i'm still trying to figure out figure them out it was fun being able to talk to you though oh yeah uh i typically uh hang out as everybody knows i typically am in my server usually rambling about shit completely unrelated to content i make so uh people as always, the link was going to be in the description. People can, uh, people can freely join that. Uh, my ability to speak just completely fell apart there for a minute. And so with that, I'm going to... Oh, wait, actually, I do have one more thing before I close this off that I want to talk about. So 
I, with a few other members of the group, we ended up watching a really bad Marble Hornets movie. Uh, the always watching thing. Oh god! And I'm still trying my best to figure out how to dodge copyright with that. Because no matter <laughs> how much I fuck up the footage, it will not let me upload it without uh, flagging it down. So I'm still trying to figure that one out. So uh, hopefully, at this point, I might just like upload it unlisted on a different channel and just put give it to specific people just as some haha funny thing we did. Maybe it's like a Discord exclusive thing. Pretty much. But, yeah, that was the last thing that on my plate that I can think of. So, with that said, I'm going to wrap this up. It was great to have you on. You can, if you ever have any kind of topics or things you want to discuss, you can always come on. Same to anybody else in the Discord, because that's the point of the voice box, is just to sit here and let people talk about things they like. It doesn't specifically have to be horror-related. Sometimes it could just be shooting the shit. And with that, I'm going to say goodnight.